helpful to bring your attention, to bring your mind, to notice your body sitting here. Just become aware of the sensation of the chair against your legs, or the cushion against your legs. So feeling that physical pressure. Noticing the temperature of the room against your skin. Just scanning your body for any points of tension. Sometimes just bringing your attention to these spots will help them just relax without doing anything else. And take a moment to find the sensation of the breath as it enters and leaves the body at the tip of your nose. And use that sensation as an anchor for your mind to help keep it here instead of following our thoughts of the past, our planning for the future. So whenever thoughts arise, just try not to follow them, but instead let them pass through the mind like clouds in the sky. Now try to generate a positive motivation, a positive
positive intention to use your time well here this morning. Again, bring your attention to your body sitting here, your awareness that there are others around you. And then just gently open your eyes. So we'll start by reciting the four <coughs> measurables, which is on page 34. Four measurables refers to the four measurable minds. And mind and heart is the same word <coughs> in Buddhism, so it's it's not making it in Buddhism we don't generally make a distinction between what we might call feelings or emotions and our intellect or reasoning. It's just all different states of mind in Buddhism. So may all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. So the four immeasurables, the wishing those for people to have happiness and the causes of happiness is the immeasurable mind of love. Wishing that beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering is the immeasurable mind of compassion. They also need beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering is the immeasurable mind of joy. It's the ability to be joyous for in others' joy instead of being jealous or envious. And then may all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. That's the immeasurable mind of equanimity, and it gets at, it's really the foundation for the other immeasurable minds to be able to develop. Because one of our obstacles to being able to um, have these minds of compassion and love for all sentient beings is the fact that we have uh, we have a tendency to follow our attachment or aversion so that we really only wish it for our friends, the happiness part and the free of suffering part. And then for those situations or people that we find difficult, we actually tend to be happy when they're suffering. And so this is a mind we're trying to change. This is one of those um, aspects of the mind that we want to uh, look at and see if it's helpful or not, or if it's actually unskillful and not, um, and leads us into suffering in the future because of harmed relationships or harmed, uh, just our regrets even cause suffering. So, um, but the mind is, you know, we have all these habits of mind and it's hard to break our habits without effort. And even with effort, it's difficult to change our minds. So, so last week we were talking just a lot about mind, how it works. Um, were there any questions from that? I know it's been a whole week. So. So basically in Buddhism, you know, when it says, um, Buddhism teaches, you know, the Buddha taught four noble truths. The truth of suffering, the truth uh, that suffering has a cause, that suffering can end, and that there's a method 
to end suffering. And so at the heart of this, or at the foundation of this, is the assertion that ignorance or our confusion about how things exist is, is the basis from which our incorrect states of mind like aversion and hatred and greed and impatience and uh, come from. And so it's this, so it's trying to figure out how to correct that confusion and then also how to cultivate our good qualities of mind while trying to refrain from are not so good qualities of mine. So um, that's basically the efforts that we try to make. And we rely on the teachings of the Buddha because it's kind of assumed that since we're not enlightened already, then perhaps we need some help in being able to develop our minds. So, um, so why is mind important? <coughs> In what way is it the creator of everything? I don't know. I mean, it just is. <laughs> That's not helpful, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> it's our perceptions or our distortions. It's how it controls our actions. I think that's the, one of the key pieces here, is the mind drives our actions of body and speech. And mind, for that matter. You know, it's like, you know, if we're practicing the mind of impatience, we just, each moment of mind can get more impatient, and then that leads to anger, and that leads, you know, who knows where. So, well, actually, we know where, but we may not want to go there. So, this is the, um, so, the, you know, mind is really important. If we want to lead uh, a meaningful life, a purposeful life, um, if we want to, on the, on, at the time of our death, to kind of be able to look back at our life and have fewer regrets and uh, feel a sense of satisfaction over how overall, how, you, how your life is, not maybe your life is gone, but how you have done, how you have treated others, then this method can help you be successful with that. What often happens is that at the end of our lives, we realize we are actually out of time. You know, that's it. We're here. You know? And we panic, and we have all sorts of thoughts about, boy, I wish I'd done that differently, I wish I'd done that differently, I wish I'd done that differently. And that's not the best mind to have at the time of death. That's a pretty miserable way to be. I remember my mom calling me a couple of months before she died. <coughs> And just being just totally, you know, like, oh my goodness, I can't, you know, I had mentioned some friend, she goes, oh, I can't remember that friend, I must have been drunk at the time you told me about that friend, and I'm going, yeah, maybe, <laughs> oh, that's probably true, you know, but she had such regret at the time of her death, and it's, and it's painful to see that, um, it must be even worse to have it, so it's just this, you know, there's, you know, we don't take care of our minds now, you know, even if we don't have a, an illness like alcoholism, we may, you know, we still may be just filled with regrets at the end of our life. And that's preventable, you know. If we try to take charge of our minds now, then we can, you know, improve our habits of mind so that at the end of our lives we have fewer regrets and have a more peaceful mind. Which in Buddhism is very important. It's, it helps um, determine what karmic seed ripens so that your next, you know, and determines what kind of rebirth you have. And whether you buy into that or not, if the Buddha's correct, it's going to determine <laughs> whether, you know, what kind of rebirth you have. But, uh, but just, you know, just the thought that when you know you're out of time and you um, don't have a chance to make up for mistakes you've made. You know, is you know, you know, we've all had that experience, and it's a terrible feeling to feel like you can't do anything to fix it, and uh, you know, and that's too bad. So, and it isn't like if we work on our minds, we'll quit making mistakes. Drat, 
you know, but we just, you know, this is how forceful our habits are. Plus, you know, it's, it reflects our, um, <clears throat> how much effort it takes to become skillful. It's, you know, it's one thing if we work on what can we do for our minds, like go to school, go to college perhaps, go, um, learn a trade, you know, in order to help ourselves or so that we can, uh, so, you know, have children in the future and be able to take care of them. You know, all these different things that we do have a very, have often have a very limited focus. They're focused on what can I do for my happiness or my success and my family and my kids or whatever. But if you What was I thinking about? Okay, so if you're working on, so that's relatively manageable, those, you know, because, you know, you're just looking at, okay, what am I interested in? What can I be educated have? What kind of job can I have? How many kids do I want? What kind of partner do I want? Those kinds of things, and it's a very limited scope. But when you are trying to work on your mind, so you, you are able to care for all beings, with the same kind of attention that you give your family or your children or your partner, then, you know, it's, it takes a lot more mindfulness and attention and a lot less, um, you know, you have to operate, you can't react reflexively from your habit energy. And that takes a lot of effort to be able to do that. So it's not an easy task to try to, to transform your habits of mind to help direct your actions consistently when your scope is everybody, everybody you come into contact with or meet. Um, so it can be a little daunting to attempt it, but the reality is we already expend energy with regretting what we say or what we do or what we didn't do or all these things that you know in our interactions with others so we're, this practice is about just taking that same energy we're already expend, ex, expending after the fact to try to use some of that energy before the fact so that we can interrupt our habit energies Anything that we know is not our is not in uh, anybody's best interest, ourselves or others, such as impatience and anger or greed, um, those kinds of states of mind. Is that making sense? Yes. yes. Okay. Any question? Yes. You, <clears throat> you said that uh, you can work on your mind, but you will always make mistakes. But isn't isn't there a point that you reach perfection? Yes, but, you know, not any time soon. <laughs> you know, the, the method, the path out of suffering, eventually clear, you know, the, you know, you eliminate all your mistaken states of mind, all your confusion about how things actually exist. So from that, your, these, um, unskillful states of mind cease to arise. You develop all these good qualities and so that you no longer, you make mistakes. What that also requires, one of the reasons why a Buddha mind is sort of, it is defined as omniscience, free, free of ignorance, is because in order to avoid any mistakes, you have to know what everybody needs. So you have to be free of ignorance have to have nothing obscuring your mind from understanding the needs of others and what will work for them, you know, in terms of helping them. So in order to develop that kind of mind, you're going to make lots of mistakes because you're going to take more risk. You know, a lot of times we don't take risk because we're not sure of what to do. But if you're really trying to help others, you're going to take risk and make mistakes. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. 
So it's sort of a, they often call bodhisattvas, you know, brave because they're willing to try to take on the sufferings of others and try to help relieve that suffering. And until you're free of ignorance, you're going to make mistakes. Now, the more you develop the uh, the fewer mistakes you make, but also just the scale of your mistakes gets smaller. <laughs> no. So, because some of the big actions you may have done when you were a kid, like, you know, grabbing a toy out of somebody else's hands, you know, you don't do as an adult. Yeah? When you say take on the suffering of others, um, I assume you mean spiritual, emotional, mental, not physical. They take on the physical pain of others as well. Or? They, yeah, I mean, they have, they're willing to take on anything. So, like, there's stories of the Buddha in his previous lives, where he, like, there's a story about um, a lioness and her cubs who were starving, and so he threw himself in the lioness's way to be killed and fed to her cubs. That's a very, 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 very advanced practice. <laughs> so, so yes, eventually, but they have lots of, you know, the, the teachings on the path have lots of instructions about not doing that too soon. <laughs> I mean, and you know, I mean, it's funny how people, you know, I mean, we talk about it, how people get compassion fatigue and they do things and then they regret them or they burn out and so they never can do them again, you know, all this stuff. It's sort of like, you know, it's over, it's, it's exceeding your boundaries. Yeah, Pam. Well, about the physical one, there is one that happens from time to time. When people give up a kidney or give up a lung, it's really, really very hard for them, you know, when they do that. They have to be in a hospital. Bone marrow transplants, yeah. Yeah, exactly. so that's a physical one. Yep. I think, in a way, with, with, when we have children, I yeah. would put myself in front of my son. I and that's, yeah. Die. We are, I believe, in this stage, but we're not in this stage that we put ourselves in front of our own. What we perceive enemies, because there are no enemies, to save them. Well, all and that is the, that's the example the teachings um, use all the time, is that we're trying to develop the mind that mothers have for their own precious child. You know, that this desire to be able to remove the suffering of others, even though we can't. But that mental, you know, when you think about if the mind drives our actions, how powerful that mind is. How different you act if you're coming from that kind of place. You know? So if a, a bodhisattva is one who has attained that kind of mind 24-7, it actually becomes, it influences, it's their, sort of their main mind where all these mental factors still arise or states of mind still arise, but they're all influenced by this desire to accomplish the welfare of self and others. Yep. Can you explain, like, when you say you make a mistake, like if you're trying to help somebody out and you make a mistake, how does that show up? Don't you know? Haven't you ever helped someone and it gone awry? Yeah, like, yeah, like if you enable somebody, you're thinking, or? I mean, I just do it all the time. You know, we give advice, thinking it'll be helpful, and we're wrong because we still have ignorance. We think we know what's best for others. We think because we do something and it works for us that it work, will work for everybody. We stick our nose in all over the place, you know, where it doesn't really, where when it doesn't help. You know, so we have to develop our wisdom at the same time. And then certainly enabling is one of those ways in which we think we're helping, but we're not. So part of the effort that that's needed in this mind transformation is really being good at recognizing 
what is actually driving us. So when we're helping someone, or think we're helping someone, when we really look, what's in it for me? Let me be careful here. Am I trying to control what they do? Am I trying to influence the method they're using? Am I trying to, you know, put words in their mouth? You know, we need to see, because sometimes we do that because we really have a great deal of investment in how something is done. You see that in work all, you know, often. Um, so it's, you know, part of this learning how to be, you know, learning not how to learn, but part of the observation of our mind is looking for the clues about where is, where am I in this story? You know, what's in it for me? What am I hoping for? And does that have any relevance to what I'm suggesting for someone else? Because, you know, that's when, you know, like if we think we're right about something, then if we haven't looked to see why we think we're right, you know, often it's just our ego getting in the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I know more than you do. You know, do it my way. Um, it can also work in the reverse. If we have low self-confidence, we can sometimes not do something because we don't feel like um, we can be helpful, you know, so we kind of don't, you know, we kind of shock me, so we don't participate. You know. Yes? What are the boundaries? Because um, some people do not want to be helped, and sometimes by you trying to help someone, you harm more, you do more damage than helping them? Well, yeah, we have to respect other people's boundaries. Mm -hmm. They're their boundaries. We don't get to choose, you know. I mean, the the Buddha said, you know, would not teach unless someone asked him three times to teach to make sure that person really wants the teachings. You know, we don't do that here because we assume that if you show up here, you're interested in the teachings. But you take what you, you know, you don't have to. You know, just because you walk through the door doesn't mean you're, you know, making an oath <laughs> to follow the advice, agree with the advice, listen to the advice, and use the advice. So, it's, um, that's part of the thing of trying to, the key on transforming our minds is learning about us. We become the object of our investigation. We have a tendency to think, as soon as we hear the word help, that this is all about, you know, you know, getting to know other people's needs, when actually it's not. It's about learning how to be very <coughs> meticulous about watching your mind and how it's influencing your speech and your actions, you know, to just recognize that. So like, Today, I'm very nervous because I have something that I have to do later on to this afternoon for an interfaith gathering. And so I'm jittery this morning, and so I'm short-tempered. That's a condition for me to be short-tempered. And instead of taking care of that and recognizing that I really need to be careful before I speak because I'm already nervous, and, and I know how I behave when I'm nervous, I did not do that, and so I was, you know, I made a mistake. So now I'm going through all that regret and, you know, like, oh, you know better. So, you know, but that's what we do. So this is, you know, it's, it's not about uh, making, you know, watching others. It's about watching ourselves and being able to recognize, you know, what's going on, you know, and being, you know, like I'm always talking about you know, noticing that first little, you know, because that's a clue that, you know, you're not comfortable. And if the sooner you recognize that, then, you know, and apply your investigation to it, the better chance you have of interrupting your habit. You know? Yeah. So, 
So how, if at all, would a more skillful, mindful person prepare for this afternoon event where I know I'm going to be really anxious? Yeah, you have to, like, this is part of the reason why we prepare in advance, isn't it? When we have a commitment to do something, we get ready for it. So it's not like we don't do this already, but we do certain kinds of things and perhaps neglect other kinds of things, like, you know, recognizing um, if you, I mean, I get, what do you call it, stage fright, you know, and I just completely forget everything, you know, just like, mm. so I've got, <laughs> so I've got my little meditation I'm leading on my phone. Because I know it's entirely possible for me to stand up in a bunch of in front of a bunch of strangers and have literally no clue what I would plan, even though I, you know, theoretically memorized it. It's not entire. Didn't know it this morning. I practiced it this morning. I'm going, oh yeah, there we go. But that's not important. It doesn't matter if I get up there and don't say anything. <laughs> I mean, you know, the only thing that gets hurt there is my reputation, you know, and then they won't ask me ever to do that again, and that might be a good thing. But it's, <laughs> it's this, but this lack of, you know, then what I didn't do is remind myself the other effects of me being nervous. I can't stop myself from being nervous. I mean, you know, maybe a couple of eons from now, I'll be able to do that. But I can take care of how I treat others on days when I'm this nervous, you know, by recognizing, oh, I'm nervous, so watch what he said. And sometimes I don't do that well, or don't do it at all. And that's, you know, and I suffer the consequences, and so do people around me. So it's a matter of, you know, really, one method to do that is to practice Tonglen, this taking and giving, or giving and taking, practice on yourself, where you visualize, you know, you take a quiet moment and you visualize yourself in that situation, being nervous, and on sending yourself the patience for yourself, that that's how you're, how you're going to be. And, but send yourself that, that, remind yourself that you're capable of slowing down so you can guard against your speech. Now, that kind of thing. So it's really about, um, this is part of that developing unconditional friendliness for yourself, of just recognizing, you know, you're not a Buddha yet. You know, you may have this aspiration to want to develop this ability uh, or transform this habit energy of mind, but you're not there yet. And so you have to be, you know, kindly try to improve your condition to minimize, you know, the, the different unskillful actions that can arise. You know? <clears throat> so it's, it, it would just be like picturing, like I can picture myself later at this event you know, and imagine myself comfortable and at ease, like with pulling out my phone if I need it so I can read it. Uh, going slowly, not speaking quickly, you know, so that I can perhaps remember what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Whatever. So, you know, that process. But also, you could think, oh, you know, you have, you know, you know that um, when you have this kind of thing, you know, you're nervous all the way up until about two hours after it's finished, you know, so, you know, you need to take care during that whole thing. And, and then tomorrow we have a visiting Rinpoche, and that just <sighs> puts me over the top with nervousness. Um, and, you know, so I'm, so I'm really today, you know. So it's this kind of, uh, unfortunately, but this is how we learn. I often remember these things after the first mistake. 
after that first, you know, like, oh yeah, that's right, I'm a rat. <laughs> I need to really be careful now. So, if we don't have unconditional friendliness, we can let these moments just kill us, mm. you know? And that's not helping. You know, it's like, you know, that's when we turn it into guilt and we get frozen and think we are this way. I can't change. It's just, you know, blah, 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 and sort of give ourselves permission not to change. You know? And that's not what we have to do. We can just say, oh, yeah, there I go. You know? What did I learn? What can this remind me of? You know. Is having uh, right speech and right actions focusing on that sometimes more useful than trying to help other people? With? Absolutely. The first person we should be looking at is ourselves. Before we, this is why you don't um, you don't even give a kidney if you think if you ever de if you think if you were to develop an illness later and it's going to kill you because you only have one kidney. You know, you think about that. Will you be able to handle it? Or will you start to hate the fact that you did this? You know? Because you want to be able to give from a place of, I'm willing to take that risk if that happens. That's okay. You know, I've talked to the doctors, it's not very risky, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah? Would you say, or would you agree that <clears throat> just recognizing, recognizing the nervousness or the fear or the anxiety to get that first signal by listening to the body? Mm -hmm. uh, I say that often. Yeah, it's a really big clue. The sooner you can feel that sense, because most of us, our minds are so fast, and so our habit energies are like instant almost, you know, they just arise immediately. But sometimes there's a clue in our body, there's often a clue in our bodies if we're noticing. And that's what I mean. So we notice that first sensation of discomfort, of just kind of like, oh, I'm, something's off here. The sooner you can recognize that and investigate what's going on there, then the more help you can give yourself before you do anything or before it gets out of control. You know, because once where you know we have a strong. Uh, agitating state of mind arise, it, you know, we're out of control then. Yeah. One more question. <laughs> You're limited to, I think, three. Yeah, I think I'm, yeah, I'm working on a second. Um, so some, for my, my belief, and maybe inaccurate, the agitation and a little bit of fear forces me to prepare, and then once I prepare, I feel a little better. Mm -hmm. So it's, and then I, or my second thing, which is much worse, is I distract myself and just go, nah, you know, until an hour before the presentation, and then I just hyper panic, hyper focus, and throw myself into it. And that's probably not the best way either. Well, I mean, I think we just all have to find our ways. Because um, some things we, you know, it's like if we decide that the only way to handle it is to get over it. You know, that I won't be, con I won't consider myself successful until I'm not nervous before doing such a thing. Then what's happening? You're not going to do it. Yeah. Well, you, yeah, you've got a condition, so it's no longer unconditional friendliness, mm -hmm. but it's also like goal oriented and not real, not, not acknowledging the reality of the process. Mm -hmm. It's a process. It's not an event. Just because you want to act a different way doesn't mean that's sufficient. Obviously. We all would like to be this way or that way and we're not there. You know, so it's just but it's a process and so we have to respect that process. And then we have to uh, this is what I think the beauty of it, in this tradition of practicing uh, purification practice. Purification practice is a recommended daily practice where at the end of the day, you look at your day and go, huh, didn't do this so well. Yeah. <laughs> and you apply four opponent powers. And the four opponent powers are regret for that unskillful action, and it could be a body, speech, or mind. 
then you have you rely on the teachings to show you a method to uh, you know to help you learn how to transform your mind to make it less and less likely in the future you have a remedy for that mistake which can be an apology which can be a practice we have practices you know uh, with mantras to try to uh, focus on our our regret of the harm we've done both to ourselves and others and also you know to um, you know just so we can get that that we really don't want to do this we don't want to continue this habit and so then we have a resolve at the end of you know saying I'm going to try not to do this for the next 24 hours or the next five minutes depending <coughs> on how strong the habit is so we just, uh, and then, so those are the four opponent powers. And then the very last thing we do before we go to bed or go to sleep is this I, uh, rejoicing about all the stuff that day that you did well, or at least in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So that you, you know, so you can let go of that day's mistakes and start fresh the next morning. And also so you remember that you have Buddha nature, so all the good things you do for others, and the good thing, you know, the right speech and right action and right thoughts, you know, that you rejoice in those, you know, because that is the basis for our capacity to become a Buddha. It's just a matter of fully cultivating that. So it's it's a way, you know. So instead of our habit of carrying our mistakes with us for all time you know I think we're born guilty you know <laughs> so you know it's this it's just going ah okay made a mistake I take responsibility for having made that mistake I will try to uh, you know remediate any harm I've done and whatever you know if it's possible sometimes you can't even apologize because it's either they're not available you, you know or it would be harmful, you know, just being in their presence. They never want to see you again, you know. So, you know, it's, you have to work on, you know, from your side. You don't worry about, well, if they just forgive me, I'd be fine. You know, it's not about them. It's about taking responsibility for your side of the stuff. You know? Yeah. I'm wondering with that taking responsibility, if it would be good for you to look at maybe taking a public speaking course, John. Let's not try to fix the teacher. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I mean that's, like, it's, it's, uh, I've had to do that myself, not in, in that because I don't have a problem with that, but in other areas where I had to perform in business and I didn't want to do something in particular, I went and I worked on it and then I did a bunch of practicing. I mean, when I saw you at the TS, I wouldn't have thought that you had any, you were so comfortable. That's why I don't need those courses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, I can do it. It's just yeah. that it terrifies me. Mm -hmm. And they, it doesn't fix that. Oh, it does not. Mm -hmm. No, because I've been doing public speaking for quite a long time now. Right now. I'm doing it right now. I do it every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Yeah. You know, oh. it's just my habit. Mm. What could that happen? Yeah, go ahead. Look, I was going to say about this. I find public speaking very, uh, I don't want to do that to myself. So I even, I even went to the course years ago, yeah. and it just makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, so I only I do it because I'm a nun, and I now I'm told to overpower, overcome this. I can't. Yep. Yeah, I can't overcome it either. I'm still, you know, it, a wreck. It's something I don't have to do. Right. And I didn't do it either for a long, 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 long time. And then one day my teacher called me at 10 of, no, at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning and said, could you teach the 10 o'clock class for me? And I'm going, no. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's not really an option. <laughs> So I had an hour to get ready. Oh, you know, 80 people or so. You know, Ooh. it's a bigger center. Uh. So I was a wreck, <laughs> and that happened a lot. And I was a wreck every time, and I'm a wreck every morning when I come here on Sundays. But that's all right, you know. But certain things ratcheted up. So today, so yesterday was the march. 
today was Medicine Buddha Puja, then class, then I have this interfaith thing, and then tomorrow Rinpoche is coming, you know, for teaching. So I'm really a wreck now. And we and what we don't need to do, or what I don't need to do, is to continue talking about it because it's making me worse. Mm. So Next. we're letting go of that for the moment. <laughs> I appreciate all your suggestions, but this really isn't about me. This is about the process of how we notice what's going on for us, not what's going on for someone else. Mm -hmm. We have a terrible habit of taking all the teachings and turning it immediately towards, you know, putting the mic, the, what do you call that? Magnifying glass on someone else mm -hmm. instead of ourselves. And we cannot change others. We can be a good condition for others to find peacefulness or to be happy or content, but we can't transform their minds. Only they can do that. So, so even though we want to take on the suffering of others, there's a limit to what, I mean obviously, if even an omniscient um, being cannot fix us because we'd all be fine. You know, if enlightened beings could just make us, you know, enlightened, we'd already be there because they're not selfish. I mean, one of the things the teaching says is that when you finally do understand how things actually exist, you know, compassion naturally arises. The wish to, to you know, bring others to this state. So it's not because it's you know it's just it's just what we do. This is our this is our Buddha nature, our natural capacity to relieve this and want to relieve the suffering of others. And a way to start that is to quit harming others. And the way you do that is by looking within and transforming your own mind so that your own thoughts and your speech and your actions are you know, more in the direction you're trying to go. So, you know, this noticing, you know, it's just that for many of us, our strongest mental habits are so quick to arise without seemingly any, you know, planning for it. You know, it's not like we notice that we're thinking, oh, dang, and then it just, you know, we explode in anger. Because we're so habituated to it, it's just like that. But we might notice it in our bodies. You know, we might feel ourselves getting tense, perhaps. We might recognize that we're starting to back up physically during a conversation from someone because we really don't like what's happening in that conversation. You know, or we might, you know, start looking at our watch or looking away or, you know, all these different things. And these are all clues to the fact that we're not comfortable. And so we need to notice that and then investigate what's going on so that then we can make a choice how we respond as opposed to just react with our usual habit energy. And after this is all successfully accomplished, then you'll be able to come back and Give us more advice on how to successfully no. manage. No. <laughs> this comes from self-awareness. You can't tell me how to be nervous. You have no clue what's going on for me. I'm the only one who can work on that. Now I can use the help of, you know, psychologists and various people of the Buddhist teachings to help me sort it out. But when it comes down to it, we have to develop our inner wisdom. We have to come up with the reasons that make sense for us for why we might want to change this behavior. You know, and so for me, the whole reason I continue to teach, because there's certainly monks and nuns who just never go there, you know. But for me, first of all, I, I, it was just happening. So, you know, like, okay, you know, you don't really ordain to say no. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, I know these teachings have been gold for me. So if I just focus on that, 
and get my ego out of it, you know, I'm quite willing to be terrified because it's worth it to me. Um, and it's my opportunity to talk about the Dharma in a world that doesn't talk about it much. So, you know. So you, but you have to figure that out. Peggy? I find that when I um, start my day with the practice and set my intention, it is so beneficial because there are so many things that can trigger you and that habit energy. But when you set that intention in the morning, you can still have the same things happen, but you you tend to be more apt to go back and take a pause. And this you is react. because you're developing a new habit energy. You know? And so that's the other book in. The end of the day, it's the purification practice and rejoicing. You know? At the beginning of the day, it's setting a motivation. Setting an intention to try to, you know, have your actions of body, speech, and mind go in the direction that suits, you know, and what's your motivation for getting out of bed in the morning? And you want to work on it so that it's it's um, bigger than just your to-do list. That it's more reflective of how you want to feel it on your deathbed. You know what's really important to you. Yep. Thank you. So listen to your body, so you can know what's happening with your mind. So one practice I use to, uh, to cultivate or to become more aware of the body is the body scan. Are there other practices to um, become more aware of what's happening in the body? Yeah. Yeah, so this is one of the beginning meditations that often start with, you know, a body scan. Just to start being clued in, you know. So like often like you'll discover that your shoulders are up here or that you're you know, your neck is, you know, you just notice. And, and then you have to kind of associate that. You have to, because as you become familiar with yourself and your mind, you'll notice that certain body manifestations, you know, reflect perhaps anxiety or reflect fear or reflect um, excitement or desire or craving. You know, so that we have these different um, uh, you know, so, and some of them are really subtle. So we have to keep looking deeper and deeper. So at first it may just seem, oh, I'm, you know, worried about such and such. But when that's resolved, you realize you still have this edge. You know, so you have to keep looking, keep looking underneath. Why, 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 why? so that we can find what's really driving us. And of course, the Buddha said, most of it is ego. Mm -hmm. You know, we're very caught up in the eight worldly concerns. You know, our reputation and being one of them, we want a good reputation, we want to be, you know, you take it to the extreme, you want fame. And you don't want notoriety, or you don't want that bad reputation, or you don't want those the, the gossips, be, you know, what they're saying that's not true, you know, be left, you know, out there. Social media makes this very challenging. Um, or you want, you know, you, you're trying, you want to be successful with financially. And so, you know, everything that's kind of directing your activities has to do with making money or, or, becoming famous, or both. Uh, or you're obsessed with your health. You know, you want to avoid any kind of physical suffering. And you, you know, you spend an awful lot of time and energy on, you know, how you can uh, stop death. You know, just, you know, no, you, you know, you either obsess over exercise, or obsess over food, or ex obsess over supplements, or obsess over, I don't know, whatever you can obsess over. Uh, and we have what, a, I don't know, nine billion dollar industry or 21 billion, I mean it's huge mm -hmm. how much money we spend on supplements and exercise and, and whatever. Probably meditation changes these days. So, <laughs> you know, and then we have, um, and then we also, on the other end, 
we're, we're constantly trying to polish our day so that it's to smooth it so we don't have any suffering, so we don't have to wait for this or that, so we can have just what we like to eat, so that we don't run out, you know, of what we like to drink, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, and what's the last one? Yeah, praise and criticism. So it seems it's similar to fame and infamy, but it's not. It's really just we like pleasing words and we don't like criticism. So harsh words. So you know where, and sometimes that makes us um, do things or commit ourselves in ways so that we're praised for it. Not because we want to do it, or that we think we'd be good at it, or whatever, <laughs> but we're actually doing it. You know, if we really look, we realize, oh, I'm doing that just so that they'll, you know, say good job. Now, it's not like that necessarily is a bad thing. It's just mostly, if that is your only motivation, compassion fatigue can really arise easily. If your desire isn't to be helpful, but your desire is to be thanked for your helpfulness, mm -hmm. that changes the scenario. So you want to, you know, so these are the kinds of things you're looking for when you're watching your mind. You know, just kind of cluing in. And whenever you, you have that sense of discomfort or you're holding your body in some way that indicates some sort of tension, you know, then you can, you know, that's, you, know, you kind of start asking yourself some questions. And our minds are very quick, so you can get very good at this, and you know, it doesn't take any time. Um, understanding what's going on takes longer, of course, but it's just, it's just you know, and then when you have more time, you kind of reflect back going, what's going on with me and that person, you know? Or what is it with me and my job, or whatever. You know, just be, you know, so you can broaden the scope a little bit. And then you can do things like you know, this, this practice of imagining yourself in these situations in the future and then sending you what the states of mind that you think you'll need. Confidence, patience, you know, the ability to listen without uh, concentrating on what you're going to say next, you know. And so, because sometimes as soon as we're talking, you know, receiving information from the boss, we almost can't hear it because we just assume it's a, you know, it's like, I'm going to lose my job or I'm going to do this, you know, whatever. So it's tainted. We can't, you know, our hearing is tainted. But if we can just keep, I'm not going to go there yet. I'm going to just listen to what's being said. Even if it's not being said skillfully, I'm going to set that aside and I'm just going to listen um, and then evaluate what's being said. And then, you know, it may be, you know, oh, yeah, I see what they're saying. I can do that. You know, no problem. So, like, a lot of people have annual evaluations or, you know, if people can find them very stressful. So you can work on that. But, yeah. If you, but a lot of people, I think, need... just a starting point of looking at themselves with unconditional friendliness. So that whatever you discover that's going on in your mind doesn't cause you to freak out, but just helps you. Um, it's just providing information. It's happening anyway. It doesn't matter whether it's nice or not. You don't have to share it with anybody. You don't have to say, oh, you should see my mind. Yes. <laughs> I'm so glad you're talking about this. Um, thank you, everybody, for your, your input. Um, what I'm hearing is uh, there's this sense of self. Myself is always the central figure in my thoughts. And um, does the self actually exist, or is this like something that's been made up, a construct? That it depends on how we're defining the self. We exist, but self, you know, myself is a label given to this particular set of body and mind. But I in, imbue that label with all sorts of qualities that, you know, some are good, some are negative. 
that, according to the Buddha, does not exist. Because what we all we are, a series of dependent arisings from moment to moment, with our body arising, um, and our mind arising, moment to moment. So every moment, you know, so it's fluid. It's not some fixed, I am this, I am this way, myself is this. Yet we tend to do that. And we don't just do it to the self. What arises as soon as you think self? Who's? Mm -hmm. How about other? Why do we even think self? Cherishing. But it comes from this sense of separation from other. You know? We, we're putting this dichotomy, you know? As soon as we think self, we're giving power to the label other. And what and our self-cherishing says we must take care of myself and mine whatever belongs to the self, which includes your family, your friends, your job. And then we imbue these things, both the self and the other, with attributes as if we are more than just a series of moments arising. It doesn't mean there isn't a continuum of my body and mind from birth to death, but it means there's nothing more than that. <laughs> it's literally the name I, self, myself, me, you know, mine, are all just labels describing this continuum of moments of body and mind, and that which I perceive as belonging to this body and mind. It's almost as if we think there is a separate self to this body and mind. That's sort of over here, or somewhere in the mind, or somewhere, you know, that kind of is not just this body and mind. And the Buddha said that doesn't exist at all. There is no um, like independent, controlling self. Yep. Does the Buddha address um, bravery? Because what you said about the children. I think you have to be very brave. Yeah, that's why they call bodhisattvas very brave. So is it addressed anywhere? I mean, well, it's, a, it's, it's all in all the bodhisattvas' teachings. You know, about this idea that we're trying to develop the courage to put selves before. Courage. Yes. Yeah. And our motivation can be, through development, this understanding that the mis one of the mistakes we're making, one of our fundamental confusion is that we think happiness comes from making sure this self, me and mine, you know, get what they want or what we perceive they need. Whereas what the Buddha said is that actually all this self-focus is an obstacle. What we need to do is equalize and exchange ourselves with others, which means that we recognize that we're all the same and wanting to be happy and not, wanna, not wanting to suffer. And that instead of always putting ourselves first, cherishing the self, we replace that with cherishing others. So we put others before ourselves. And this takes courage. A lot. So this is why it's a process, not an event. Right, so, the, mm -hmm. so the opposite of courage would be fear, yep. which is where most of us begin. And what is a part of that fear? They say even that children really have this fear. What's that first fear? Death. Yeah, we can't, won't survive. You know, body, you know, small children know that how dependent they are, you know? So, you know, if, you're, if your parents aren't, aren't able to take care of you, you know, this causes a lot of fear in children. 
So, you know, they're aware of this. It's like, you know, on the, the coverage on the march yesterday, that, you know, one woman was marching uh, because her six-year-old child had asked her, you know, about, you know, being safe in school. So it's just, it's this, kids are, you know, they're not oblivious. They know they're vulnerable. So just like a mother or a father, really, you know, when their child is very sick or in terrible mental anguish, really would take on that suffering if they could. You know, we want to develop that attitude towards everyone. And that that actually is the method to end suffering. Say that again. That that is the method to end suffering. <coughs> Caressing others. Yeah. May I assume that it is what you're talking about now is encompassing what they've said that bravery, nonviolence, is the form of bravery not violence, because it takes way more courage to, to, to fight, not to fight, with no violence. Well, that's, why would that be? I mean, there, it's really obvious why that would be in the teachings, in the Buddhist teachings. Why is violence contradict the teachings on happiness. Is that because violence comes from fear? No, it's because violence harms others. Yeah, we, we think we could people. like literally kill all our enemies and then our lives would be perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happens when we kill all our enemies? You get more enemies. Mm -hmm. You know, and part of that isn't just the simple, it's not just, you know, it's the fact that as soon as one problem ends, we find another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be on the big scale or it can be on that little scale. We have the habit of thinking, not getting what we want in the time we want, all these things and the flavor we want means we're not gonna, you know, be happy. So we try to control everything. So as soon as we solve one problem, we just see the next thing that's in the in what we perceive is in the way of our ability to be happy, as we keep persisting in the idea that happiness is out here, as opposed to from within. So um, we were—I thought we were on a great track. Of, and sorry, we got off. Right. So we were on the courage, but then we went to fear, and we were talking about the origin fear at a very young age, that's where we started off. So what I'd like to come back to is the fear and the first steps in, in surmounting that. Well, or, one is this, this is looking at the self. Who are you afraid of dying? Me? Yeah, that attachment to me. You know, as soon as we can let go of this attachment to me or my life or my world or my the things that I think should be this way or that way or blah blah blah, then that fear, you know, of losing that ends. So it's sort of this idea, it's a, this is a big picture idea. It's, it's this a kind of idea of if I'm you know, it's like what soldiers do. I mean, you know, if you're really looking at why they join up, you know, it's this idea I'm willing to die for the world to be a better place. Or for my, you know, my country to be safe, or whatever. You know, it's that ability to say, I am just one person. There are seven billion others. And so what I need to focus on is how can I make things better for those seven billion others instead of being so caught up in myself. So children can't do that. You know. So this is where practice comes in, because it's the setting intention, essentially. It's an understanding, and reaching understanding with the, of this, with this, and then, uh, uh, and then the intention of my thought, speech, action being in that direction, which will free me then essentially from the fear. Is that correct? To a degree? 
because that would then give me the courage of my conviction or the courage of my intent. I'm not quite certain how. Hurts. It's it's. It's a it's a multi-faceted approach. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things is just noticing how our minds work. You know, finding that, where am I in this picture? You know, so that when we can maybe release a little bit of a hold on this I in the picture. You know. So, and we can do that with the small stuff. You know, we realize, oh, I just really want to go to that movie instead of this one. So I keep pushing for all the reasons why we really should go to this, this place for dinner because it's closer to that movie, which is what I really want to do. You know, we're, we, we're incredibly manipulative. <laughs> Sorry, you can't even keep up with my mind, you know, my manipulative mind. So, you know, but we just want to look at why, um, why, we're, what logic are we using in our minds? You know, just observe our conversations that we have in our mind. You know, when we're thinking about the list of things we want to do, or things that we have to do, or da da da, and the order we're going to do them in, and da 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 da, and then by the fact that we're getting a little tense because we're running out of time, or da 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 da, we really want to look at what's behind that, what's driving. Because then we can make better choices. You know, people's lives have gotten so busy. If nothing else, you want to look and kind of go, "What can I get rid of here? You know, what's not really serving me well?" So, just so for example, so in, you know, professionally, I could be courageous in, in my service, um, but I, but I fail there too quite often, and I'm, I'm very fearful about some accidents aspects of my professional life. My personal life, on my morning walks, I find myself saying to myself, you know, I really want to serve. I want to get stronger. I want to feel better. Just, I can serve better in my community. You know, I walk around town and I see what's going on. But there's something that seems to always be well, you have to find in that. the way. Right. So I guess that's what I'm getting to is that there's just a process. That there's process to this. Mm -hmm. So you just, you know, you try to notice what gets, you know, like, so in the moment when you're trying to reach out to somebody or to do something, you know, you look at what are all the excuses not to that arise and look at what they mean. You know, is it reputation? Is it lack of confidence? If it's not knowing how to do something, you know, that all those, you know, are there ways to circumvent that, you know? You join a group, you do it, you know, so you don't have to do it alone, all those kinds of ways. And then you, you know, you discover, and also you look at your self talk, which we talk about a lot, because we tell ourselves all sorts of amazing untruths, otherwise known as lies, <laughs> you know, exaggerations, and exaggerations, we were, yeah, we, you know, well, well, this is what aversion and attachment are all about, aversion, you know, that pushing away of things we don't like, is exaggerating the negative qualities of whatever it is we're pushing away, our attachment is exaggerating the good qualities of whatever we're trying to draw close, it's the basis, this exaggeration is the basis of the distortion. You know, we do it with ourselves, we do it with others. So we want to be able to learn how to look at things without that. You know, to recognize, oh, you know, I mean, we know how to do this already just by being, you know, adults. You know, we've all known the mind of infatuation and love is blind and all that kind of stuff. And we just need to apply, you know, we need to recognize, okay, I'm really angry right now. And so right now, that mind of anger can't see anything good about the object of that anger. Well, that's a distorted mind. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to trust this mind. This mind is unreliable because it's distorted by exaggeration of the negative. And the same thing with attachment. You know, so we can start off with like our attachment to an idea. You know, I want this to happen. You know, and really look at what we're exaggerating. Like really is it at the end of the world if it doesn't happen like this? Or that you don't even get this, you get that instead. So that through this sifting out what are the exaggerations, you get better knowledge about the situation. You know? So that, you know, it, it diffuses those intense 
states of mind that arise. Now, it won't do it in the moment. If you're already angry, you know, you have to just do whatever you can to let that anger pass because it's impermanent too. Mm -hmm. And then reflect on what's going on. So the fact that we're afraid of losing our reputation, of losing our money, of losing our health, of losing our life, all those things we need to see in, which, in what ways that fear is influencing our decisions. Because, yeah, you're going to die. That's a fact. You know? And we do not know when. That's also a fact. So letting it influence what we do in this moment seems a little pointless. Nothing we do in this moment can you know, cause that not to be a fact. So letting it in fact this thought, you know, control us is, you know, it, it might not be very skillful. Yeah, John. Personally, I, I don't have a, a problem with facing death. I, I have more of a fear of facing a life that <coughs> is going to be prolonged pain than Yeah, that's what death. most people yeah. you know, But still, you have to work with that because it may happen. So the point is, if you're expending, you know, any kind of worry time on something that it does, it's not happening now, <laughs> You have to ask yourself, is that a good use of my time? Mm -hmm. Now, certainly, we can use it because it's information that is correct. You know, we're going to die. And that how we take care of our health can impact that. Might not. May have nothing to do with it. We might get killed in a car wreck. You know? We may have be exposed to a disease we never heard of. You know, catch some Ebola virus on some trip somewhere, you know. So, but we know that <clears throat> taking care of our health can improve our quality of life until that moment comes when we die. So it's, you know, that's useful information. Taking care of our mind can also be incredibly useful <laughs> for whatever happens till the point we die. And if we don't work on our minds, it's not going to matter much what happens to the body. You, know, you can have everything going for you, you know, good health, good circumstances, good conditions, all those things, but because you can't control your habit energy that's not skillful of mind, you know, you don't really notice. You know? So, certainly, taking care of our bodies is important, but so is our mind, since our mind drives everything else. And our mind is something we actually can influence in a much, with a much greater level of success than our bodies. We don't have a whole lot of control. We can take care of it. We can go to the doctor. <coughs> we can take medicines. But it really, you know, that's about it. Our mind is not physical. We can exert an awful lot of effort into transforming the way we think and be successful. But it takes diligence and persistence and, and knowledge. We have to really be, you know, able to observe ourselves, put the effort into developing that habit so that we know what's going on. So we can see whether, okay, I have a habit of thinking this way. Is it working for me or not? If not trying things, is you know, is that working out for me, or am I sacrificing my quality of life because I have a fear? You know, it gives us more choices, and it's still a choice. It's not like you have to say, "Well, I'm gonna." start doing this now because I'd rather be a person who could do that, you know, if you don't want to. You know, so it's not about, you know, or I'm going to try it out and see. We can evaluate and go, yeah, I'm on the wrong track somewhere. 
or not. But we have a tendency to imbue every moment of our life with a significance that drives us crazy. You know, we imbue that self, that sense of self, oh, this happens to me, or if I do this, you know, we have this absurd kind of uh, grasping onto some sort of permanent self that's not there. So, okay, so what if you do do this? It doesn't work out. Do you remember all your mistakes since the time you were born? No. You know. You might want to look at the ones you are still carrying around because it might be some information there to say, ah, okay, what's that about? What am I holding on to? Do I just expect myself to be perfect and never have made that kind of mistake? Well, whatever. Do I think that, you know, it's like sometimes when you lose a relationship, you think, I'm never going to be happy again. As if, that person was in your life always, and you were never happy before they ended. You know that happiness exists separately from that person. You know, so we we want to look at how we distort self and others. All right, so say hello to everybody just for a minute because we're almost out of time. <laughs> Introduce yourselves to be more specific. I'm from the gym. Hi, I'm Jim. Hi, Pam. 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 At the beginning of your talk, um, you just had a really, really quick rundown for the four, four noble truths. So, and I just would like you to go over it again. Okay. There's, there's it's the truth of suffering. Yeah. The truth of the origin of suffering. Origin. <coughs> or the cause. The truth of the cessation of suffering. Suffering can end. And the truth of the path out of suffering. So there's a method to end the suffering. Origin of cause. Okay, that's what I need. Okay. So the reason the Buddha taught them in that order is because he said that, you know, we need to recognize that we suffer in order to be motivated to look at why. Mm -hmm. So that's why he taught the truth of suffering first, and then the truth of the cause of suffering, because the good, he said that, because, for two reasons. One is that there's no point in looking at the truth of suffering if there's no way to end it. So you want to look at the truth of suffering, and then you want to look at the origin of suffering in order to see if it can end. And the Buddha said, if you do this, you will find that it's possible to end it and that there's a method to it because it's not a moment. It's not an event. It's a process. And that process is a path. So in this tradition, in the Tibetan tradition, we and all four schools of Tibetan uh, Buddhism have, you know, a very similar um, instruction manual, so to speak. Um, in this particular tradition, the Gaeli tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, um, Lama Tsongkhapa, who was uh, around in the 1300s, Divide, he wrote a lot of things, and one of the things he wrote was a book called The Graduated Path to Enlightenment, um, the great treatise, Graduated Path to Enlightenment, 
which was a commentary on a short teaching by Lama Tisha, who was asked to come from India to Tibet, um, and he wrote this short text that covered all the steps that you need to take in order to end cyclic existence, end suffering. And I get when Lama Zongkhapa was born, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm just, he recognized that the practitioners in Tibet had gotten kind of confused about the path, so he wrote a commentary to clear up some of the things. So it's much longer than that short text. Um, and then there are all sorts of texts that have the teachings that have come from that. So it's taking all the teachings of the Buddha and organizing them in a way that's very methodical about what, about what you need to do in order to achieve the result. Um, and all the schools of Buddhism have a teacher who did that. They're, they tend to be called long rim texts because that just means graduated path um, in Tibet. So uh, we tend, you know, so our teachings, are, you know, kind of stem from that source, you know, in this methodical way that you have to recognize your, you know, your precious human rebirth with these good conditions. You need to recognize that it will end, that we are impermanent. You know, so we don't, we want to remember death, so we use our time well. Mm -hmm. Because we have this really good rebirth, because we have a physical support for our mind that actually lets us observe our mind and make changes. Mm -hmm. So this is good news. Um, and then we look at understanding how we got stuck here, the causes of suffering, why we're in this cycle, of birth, rebirth, you know. How to interrupt that so we can be liberated from this kind of suffering existence. So we look at karma, how that works, because that's the law of cause and effect. And then we look at what is the origin of happiness. So we look at the bodhisattva's lifestyle of wanting to, you know, that all their actions to be a benefit to others. Then we have to perfect wisdom so we don't have any of that ignorance anymore influencing um, our thought process and our actions um, unwisely. And so on and so forth. Yes? You never mentioned the word meditation. Mm -hmm. That's part of the path. I get so that, right. And you never mentioned it, and I read it in the book. If you don't meditate, Meditate, meditate is not just on the cushion. Meditate is this method of observing the mind and then transforming. That's it's also sitting on the cushion. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but I'm they just don't. saying you never mention it. Okay, sorry, I'll try to mention it. No, I just think that it's part of the it's part of the process. Yeah. Well, it's not. It's it's. And it's the part of the process throughout the entire path. The last stage of the path is called the path, well, not the last. The second to last is the path of meditation. It's an advanced practice because first we have to become very observant about our minds. Because until we study the path, we have nothing much to meditate on that will help us. <laughs> well, that's what they say. You know? oh, okay. But don't forget, I, I was from... I think it's the Zen method. Yeah, very spread. different tradition. Yeah. Very different method. Mm -hmm. The path that they describe is, is emphasizes other things first. So, um, I lost my train of thought. What was I thinking about? <laughs> you were yeah. explaining the basic method. <coughs> yeah, so when we just start a class where we just rest for a moment and try to bring our awareness to this present and learn how to not follow all our thoughts. That's sort of the, you know, and then scanning our body to kind of notice where our body is. That's sort of the beginning practices. And then, you know, through, you know, as we develop our knowledge, then we, we, there, we have meditations on death. We have meditations on the precious human rebirth. And this is what we do in the Discovering Buddhism series on Thursday nights. Um, is learn what it is you would med think about in your meditation. Um, 
Yeah. So we'll go into it. Remind me. Put it in the jar. Just put it in that jar so that I will remember to um, discuss that more fully. There's a jar, a question jar back there. So that would be helpful for me to, to not just go, what's going on in my life? We'll talk about that. So, um, but meditation isn't just this process of sitting on a cushion. Sitting on a cushion is good because it gives you, because you're developing a physical stability that can help us with our looking at our mind. Mm -hmm. It helps with mind training. Mm -hmm. But it's not it's necessary. Good. You can sit on a chair and do it. So it's just, you know. But it's sitting quietly is the key for the beginner. Yeah, John. Can you recommend a good book on long run? Oh, yeah, I can, we can talk about that. That's what we studied on Tuesday nights is the actual text I just referred to. So that you come, you come to that class. So. Um, okay, so we're out of time. Um, so thank you for participating. And let's dedicate our efforts to thinking about our minds and thinking about how we might work on our minds by reading the dedication verses on 246. You want to do announcements first? Go ahead. Our director would like to announce No, I did. No, I, I have to wait. Ralph would like to <laughs> yes, like our question. director to make an announcement. Our questions jar. We do have a question jar over there, the glass jar on that table. And there's a little some pad of paper. So if anyone has a specific question they would like to ask or have discussed in class, please write your question and put it in the jar. Um, just reminding everyone that Yonsei Rinpoche will be with us tomorrow evening and Tuesday um, evening, evening at, from 7 to 9. And this is, uh, we are so lucky to have him come. Uh, it's $20 suggested donation for that. Uh, please try to come early if you can. Uh, no food or drink in the Gompa. Uh, next Sunday is Easter. And we will be here. Also have, since it's the first Sunday of the month, join us for lunch after class. And that's also an opportunity for newcomers to ask questions. Yeah, so I'll be here for, we can do a newcomer session at, during our little lunch. You know, bring your own lunch if you're interested and then stick around and I'm happy to ask, answer any questions that I can if you, you know. So um, we're gonna try to make that a regular thing on the first Sunday of the month. Um, and then if you're interested in going to Fort Lauderdale this afternoon, there's, please join us. Yeah, there's an interfaith thing that starts at 2 with a labyrinth, but then it has different prayers from different traditions at 3. It's a, a unity church in Fort Lauderdale. There's a sign on the bulletin board. Um, but And then, yeah, if you have the chance to come for Rinpoche's teachings, it's, good, it's a good idea. So, um, and it costs more... We we off, we ask for a higher donation because uh, there's more expenses involved in having visiting someone visiting us, uh, you know, because we also take care of their meals and their travel expenses and stuff. So, um, and then we also make them an offering because they don't you know they don't get paid to come teach us unless we make an offering. So, uh, and so. You know, the whole point of our requested donations is about the cost of running the center. And the center costs like $7,000 a month to run, and we don't raise that. And so we really, for the center to keep its doors open, we really need your support. So uh, this is a nonprofit. Um, we don't have any means of support other than the community, what you all give us. Um, you know, the, the organization that we're a part of is, does not give us any funds. We give them funds for them to survive. Um, so, and we benefit from, from all the resources that they share with us. So, there you go with that. So, let's dedicate our positive actions that the body is teaching mind. <coughs> May all beings everywhere, everywhere plagued by, by suffering the body and mind. Obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. 
May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored to find and repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food, and the thirsty find water in the streets. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness, and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be free from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and the those around be free. May the powerless find power and make people think they can manage each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, and until then may I too remain to dispel the mysteries of the world. Oh, yes, and the other announcement that is if there's a handful of people that would be interested in staying after just for a few minutes, um, we need some strong hands to move the throne. Or you want to say, Ron Boucher? Yeah, so he does have a bad back, but if can help, that would be most appreciated so we can get ready for tomorrow night without, uh, you know.